there's another thing that people need to be aware of that what they're searching for and we talked about it early on in the show we, we talked about them searching for particles and there's a specific one that they're searching for and this is called the atman particle or the atma particle and it's talked about in if you haven't guessed it the up and shads in the vedas and it is a very very interesting particle a it's invisible even though they're going subatomic they can't detect this particle it's that hard to find and it is a particle that they believe goes to the core of establishing godhood so this atma particle it's, it's rather interesting it's invisible but what it does do is is it merges with particles that they can measure and they believe that this is the particle that has the main essence of man in it or what man can become they believe that it is the knowledge of the universe that is accessed through this particle and this knowledge through quantum entanglement is instantaneously sent around the whole physical universe ongoing and they're trying to find this particle to tap into to tap into The history of our Earth is so different from what we can imagine. Enjoy the journey. The Smithsonian, that if they found out about a large skeleton somewhere, was to go get it. I'm going to assume at least one person is right, because if one person's right, it busts the paradigm. It all goes back to the fallen chair. And the problem with the modern day church, they have a very truncated view of the supernatural. This backdrop is just pregnant with all kinds of meaning associated with this Mount Hermon event. And this guy defects from the kingdom. That's a big deal. Welcome back to Blurry Creatures, the never-ending dive into the ancient world, trying to figure out what's into the, going on into around the, Into us. the weird, weirder, and even weirder than that. Yeah. And we're bringing on the encyclopedia, the myth, the man, the legend himself, Gary Wayne today. He knows a lot of facts and a lot of names and a lot of places, and sometimes you're like, wait a minute, I need to Google that, I need to Google that, I need to Google that. There's a few people we have on the show that are like walking encyclopedias you know he's one Dr. Judd Burton Derek Gilbert like the first to come on top of my head that just can rattle things off Tim yeah I mean that's why we say we're two dummies yeah we just we get to sit and absorb some of this and it's really it's really it's really fun so yeah great to, great to have Gary Wayne back of course uh, author of the Genesis 6 conspiracy, conspiracy theory we've had him on the show a couple times it's returning for a third time and Nate we're going to talk about CERN that's right we talk about it a little bit here and there but uh, we're going to dive into it again, and we're going to give you more of a historical context to how it sprung up, its roots back to Buddhism, other crazy things. To the Vedas, and to the mystery, mystery of Babylon, the seven, seven sacred sciences, and all the way back to the Watchers. Yeah, which is just what we talk about on our show. Yeah, outside of it all, we love it. Thank you for listening to our podcast, and thank you for supporting our podcast, sharing our podcast on social media. A lot of people have been sharing our memes on their Instagram reels, and that's just... That's just amazing. Anyone who shares our show, texts it to a friend, leaves a review, I can't say thank you enough, and also just takes some time to give a shout out to all the members of our show, people who sponsor the show every month and make this possible and allow Luke and I to spend hours and hours and hours every week producing, recording, promoting the show. So members of the best, thank you so much. Appreciate you guys. If you want to become a member, how do you do that, Luke? Go to our website. There's actually a little button that says join. Or become a member and just click on that. The Nate made a great video. People, you might not know this out there, but you know Nate. Nate is the whiz behind all the editing here and, and the splicing of all the '80s amazingness together. But Nate's actually originally a video guy. So you know, if you, if you follow our social media, you don't get on it. Go to go, especially go to our Instagram page because Nate puts together some amazing video. All to say, there's a video that talks about what you get um, alongside a membership and alongside supporting the show. 
uh, what comes along with that. So take a look at that. It'll tell you how to do it. It's a uh, it's a video by dummies uh, meant to meant to show you <laughs> how to, how to how, if you were a dummy how to join. Not that everyone's a dummy, but we are. Uh, yeah, check it out. If you are a member, thank you. And yeah, we're gonna roll that time cop, and we're gonna bring on Gary Wayne. No, you're now entering the bone zone. The <laughs> The blurry verse. <laughs> Let's get Gary on the show. Welcome back to the show. Welcome back to Blurry Creatures. Gary Wayne, author of the Genesis 6 Conspiracy. You've been on the show a couple times. Thanks for coming back on. Last time we talked, you said you were writing a Giants book, and maybe maybe we'll talk a little bit about that specifically, but uh, appreciate you coming back on Blurry Creatures. Yeah, thank you for inviting me back. And uh, I think I wrote almost my last lines to the last chapter. Of course, the last chapter is a little bit longer than I anticipated. So it's probably going to be like three chapters or four when I split it up. But it's going to be somewhere between chapter 81 and 83 will be the end of the book. So it's it's as I had promised to be smaller than the first book. I just didn't say how much smaller. So it's not a whole lot smaller. <laughs> Count those words, Gary. Count those words. Yeah. <laughs> You've been on the show before, so you might you might know what we, we talk about a lot about Bigfoot on our show. Yeah. Did you discover anything new about Bigfoot while writing this book? Um, I wasn't really uh, getting into the the Nephil or the uh, the Bigfoot or Sasquatch or, or Yeti sort of aspect of it. So that is uh, that's an, uh, that's kind of a future book that I was going to put in diff- maybe different kinds of the Nephilim and stuff like that, but. That's not really the theme of this book, although I, I'll touch on it just here or there. I need to group that with all the different sort of looks to these kind of creations that are out there, right? So, you know, there's more than just the uh, what I think that the uh, the Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Yeti are related within the larger group of Nephilim creation, a similar kind of creation, I think, perhaps even going back to some specific gods, which is really sort of gets my attention. But there's like the dog nephilim there are the lion nephilim Mm -hmm. there are the bird nephilim and of course the serpent nephilim that i tend to talk mostly about and then there's other creations too there's the little ones that we we did a show on so i think i want to package that maybe all in sort of a specific book this one here is about giants it's going to be genesis 6 conspiracy part 2 and it's going to have a subtitle something like prehistory and prophecy It'll be a little bit longer than that because that's they always want to say how this helps with this or does that. So it'll be more of a statement for the subtitle. So it goes really deep into fallen angels. It goes really deep into everything it says in the Bible about giants. It goes really deep into the patriarchless nations, which have Raphaim patriarchs. It goes into the battles of uh, the, what I call the Nephilim wars or the Raphaim. Faim wars that happen after the flood. And there's many, including the ones in the Exodus and beyond. And all the way through, I'm connecting that into end time prophecy. And then the last half of the book is talking about end time prophecy and being defined by all of those imageries and things that I was discussing in the first part of the book hmm. about prehistory with giants and things like that. So, oh, and, and, and the abyss, which we'll probably talk a little bit about today. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Hey, what? Gary, wait real quick. When is the book? Do you know when the book's coming out? Do you have a date for it? No, I don't because I still have to um, go through and edit it myself and do some connecting of it. I I would like to have it out early in the year, but I'm not convinced I'll hit the publisher's deadlines. So typically, you know, they're using, they're out three months minimum in advance from receiving the manuscript to doing everything that they need to do to get it out. So, but I'm my own worst enemy on it. I just kept adding more and more and oh, more yeah. stuff. <laughs> so. And it does come out, Gary. We'd love to have you on. Talk about the new book. and yeah, uh, Absolutely. So I, We can unwrap some of these rabbit holes. That I don't yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. We, we You're already teasing about, it hard here. It's yeah, like, man, let's talk about that. But yeah, that's not what we're here for today. I know. <laughs> I was going to say, we, t- we, we, we tried to do an episode on the Nephilim Wars. 
And um, it's too big. It's too big of a subject. Yeah, they're rumored to be pretty massive wars between these these tribes. And yeah, I can't imagine what life was like, actually like back then. But today we're talking about CERN. Thanks for coming back on the show again. And how do you begin the conversation with CERN when you when you talk about it? Where do you start? Well, that's a really good question in itself because it, it's a very large topic as well. I know I tend to make everything very large topics, but really when you <laughs> dig in and get behind the onion and peel it back, there's a there's a lot in there. And I, and I know you've done a show on CERN. I'm not sure exactly what's been covered, but I'll just maybe sort of preface it with what I think are areas that are all interconnected and related related, but all sort of go into sort of different sort of directions in terms of their history and stuff like that. So, yeah, you know, obviously when people talk about CERN, it's like, what does the name mean? And so within CERN, you've got a certain imagery that goes with it and you've got all of these allegories and you got things like, what is the name CERN? And you've got the imagery of Shiva and Atlas program and all of those things. You've got a power base that's in CERN as being a very powerful organization that's connected in into the UN, and they have a specific dogma and agenda that they have that's quite public. You have a emerging of technologies there, you know, all sorts of physics and science, but specifically what intrigues me is the AI and the quantum computing that merges. You've got a history of quantum computing that most people don't know about where most of the original scientists and quantum mechanics got most of their information from and what they build on and what they believe you need to know. There is the connection back to Babel and portals in the occult. Uh, You have this notion of what might they be looking for when they're trying to break down particle girls or what else are they doing? And then you've got connections to the abyss, which is sort of in the in the mix within the imagery and within perhaps some of the the science that that they're doing. So you've got all of those sort of different areas that go into CERN. And I'm not sure where you'd like to start, but typically, you know, I I kind of like to talk just a little bit more about its place in the world and sort of back my way into some of this stuff, unless there's some areas where you think that you want to start first, because I can go back and forth pretty easily. Yeah, let's go, Gary. Take us down the rabbit hole. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things that people don't know about CERN is is it's sort of renowned as the birthplace for the World Wide Web in 1990 mm. and connected to uh, Tim Berner-Lee. And its connection to that high tech part of this sort of new age is something that people don't know that it has this history. So it's tied into the world that they've been creating. And it is continuing to work in that direction in terms of how they're going to dominate and populate this new digital subatomic world and what they plan to sort of introduce. So I just thought I'd let people know about that. And, you know, they're they're kind of famous for their web pages as being sort of hypertext media. So you can imagine their connections that would go into medias and other sort of cabals of secret societies and things as you sort of pull that back into the secret societies aspect. But one of these things that really sort of tweaked my interest early on is, is that they have U- UN observing status, which is most unusual. There is another group that's not a country that has that sort of status, and that's the Knights of St. John. Hmm. Uh, and so it's not, and that's the only two that I'm aware of. There may be more, but it's the only two that I'm aware of. So I have the right to speak at the General Assembly and during debates. They have the right to sign in on resolutions and vote on procedural matters, and they have a right to sign as uh, signatories on working papers. So this is not just one individual. This is an organization that's behind it, and there's a lot of funding that sort of goes behind it. And CERN believes in their dogma is that science is a vehicle for social change just as they were one of the big proponents of inventing the or of making the internet more worldwide not inventing it because they unless they were working with the US and the US army then and I don't have anything on a status to say that they were in on that but didn't Al Gore yeah. invent the internet yeah so he, <laughs> well there you go 
<laughs> That's true. He he trumped that whole sort of <laughs> sort of science, so to speak. Um, so they believe it's a social uh, vehicle for social change, and the things that they like to focus on in their sort of virtual signaling and changing the world is the refugee crisis, gender equality. They believe in stem cell science and technology, and really promote that sort of stuff, and and also engineering and math. They're at the forefront of science in Europe, but I think they're probably at the forefront of science with their branches and their connections all all around the world. Uh, CERN uh, partners with uh, companies to get its technology into the marketplace, and people don't know that. They're inventing and doing things and getting that new technology out through oligarchical companies all around the world. And they put licensed agreements and places on this technology. So they're getting significant revenue to continue to fund this massive set of projects they're doing. And they do something that's called KT groups, which is groups of knowledge and technology for the development of these things. But KT is a typical secret society term that's used in the Masonic society and it's short for Knights Templar. So again, you get these sort of eerie connections. But if you understand that secret societies were born from the seven sacred sciences and that the mystery schools and secret societies are all part of the same sort of organizational structure, they're creating this knowledge from the past. So they're trying to be like the days of Noah. So it starts to come a little bit together, but it's, I thought it was good to understand a little bit of the grander sort of agenda that they have. And CERN uses something called a Hadron Collector to search for a new and unknown cosmic particles. Specifically, they like to look at things like in dark matter, but there's photons and and things like that. But it's this idea that they're looking for particles. And, you know, I noticed in the news lately that they've announced that they've found a few new particles out there. Nothing that they're announcing that's significant, but just as when people talk about, you know, the, the God particle and things like that, the Hoson particle that's also that they're apparently sort of looking for or working on. These ones are a little bit different. They're called uh, pentaquark, which are sort of single particles, and tetraquarks, which are pairs and particles. Those aren't the ones that they're looking for, but they're sort of lo- looking continually for these types of particles. And they're looking for elementary particles, I guess is what I'm saying. And they're using induced quantum energy to do that. So let's just sort of back up a little bit in terms of the technology that they're using. And I'm, I'm going to start in here because I think this is really going to start to make some of the other stuff that I'll talk about make a little bit more sense. So if you go back, you've got quantum computing, quantum history, and essentially that's kind of done by, you know, began by a pioneer by the name of Wolf, Wolfgang uh, Pauli. And he saw his search through the occult side of things. He was also a proponent of Carl Jung and sort of adopted a number of his philosophies, alchemy, and Eastern religions in in particular. And so he was the one that started beginning this whole process of trying to unravel what is quantum math and, and that led into quantum physics and then quantum computing. And then with quantum physics, you have people like Niels Bohr, who also consulted the Vedas. You have uh, Werner Heisenberg, who also was into the Vedas and the Upanishads. And they thought quantum physics was perfectly consistent with what was written in the Vedas. And that you've also got another fellow by the name of Schrodinger. And he believed that quantum physics and the Upanishads were sort of united in, in that it reflected a unity that both reflected a unity in wave mechanics and particles in terms of what they were talking about. And the key point is, is, is that the pioneers believed that you couldn't get your head around figuring out quantum me- mechanics unless you understood the Vedas. And mm. they also believed as, as an extension that came out of this, and this has been really popularized in the last number of years, is that, you know, the universe is thought in this sort of understanding is like a quantum computer, like the matrix is the common sort of ideology, which is a typical sort of occult ideology, and that there are multiple dimensions. And the up and shads particularly talk about all of these particular dimensions. And so you have this occult history 
that is married into what's going on at CERN with a lot of its occult imagery. So that's not a surprise, particularly when you look at maybe Shiva. Yeah. You also have AI that is being merged there and in a few other places around the world, and it's probably growing sort of as we go. But AI is a different sort of technology as well. And the problem with quantum computing is it's sort of single shot uh, for the most part, unless they've unless the new technology has advanced it. AI allows it to search in many directions at the same time and many dimensions at the same time. So it's something that they need to sort of speed up the process. And the whole idea about adding AI in, in t- into the mix is that AI represents a consciousness. It represents something that's going to be sentient sort of down the road. may not be today, might be today, but it certainly would be heading in that direction as being sentient down the road. Hmm. And so if you listen to people that are in the, in the scientific and AI world is they talk about demonic activity or talking to spiritual guides and all sorts of sort of mysterious things that sort of go on in the world of, of AI and, and, and high-end sort of computing. So if our audience isn't familiar, the Vedas are the ancient Hindu yep. Sanskrit texts, right? Antediluvian, according to their history. Yeah. So yeah, so my question then is, if we're talking about consulting this, are we maybe to assume that, that this is some of the, maybe the mystery Babylon stuff, like this is ancient, like the, the idea of quantums and some of the stuff they're doing at CERN is actually, that they're, they're trying to go back and access sort of ancient yes. ancient tech or ancient knowledge that existed in, yes. you know, before the flood in the golden age. That's exactly what they're doing. The days okay. of Noah, both before and after the flood with Babel being after the flood. Yeah. And I just wanted to, I wanted to do clarify that for people because I know we have, we haven't touched and on that's the uh, connection to Shiva, right? Yes. It, so that this, yeah, Shiva is, is the destroyer God that uh, is connected to other gods of the pantheon and the end of days. And so, and, you know, I was just noting that, you know, Elon Musk, he said a few years ago that with AI, they were essentially summoning demons. So they're, <laughs> summoning some sort of intellectual beings and it's not unusual that in that end of scientific discovery that they're receiving knowledge from whatever you want to call them from whatever dimension that they might be in that they believe that they're doing that they're communicating with and daemons is kind of the ancient word for it, and this word that they're starting to use it's the mod it's been translated it transliterated into demons today but the name of that comes up in some of those conversations is the name Metatron. And Metatron uh, is also the sort of the first part of the word is what's used quite a bit these days in the metaverse. It's used in what uh, Facebook is now using as their companies. Again, you can tell who they are and what they are by the imagery that they do. Metatron is a character in the book of Third Enoch, Antediluvian. And this is Enoch, son of Cain. This is Enoch, who's the creator of the seven sacred sciences. And he becomes like a god because of all of his knowledge and sort of akin to Thoth, how he is raised to godhood in the Egyptian pantheon. And this is the name of the individual that they say that they're talking to. And Enoch, when he's raised up to be like the son of God, as it's talked about in third Enoch, to angel status and even higher, they're saying that the uh, book of Enoch says that Enoch had his name changed to Metatron oh. to reflect that. Hmm. And so you've got, again, kind of this spooky kind of stuff that is just crazy and unbelievable that they're using with imagery and these names that come up out of, out of history. So when we look at the, the imagery that comes out of CERN, Shiva is, we'll just touch on that one because we already talked about Shiva is one of the gods of the subcontinent of India's pantheon. And it's, it's a significant god, a god of war, god of destruction, a destroyer of, of worlds. And so when you have this type of individual that is being sort of symbolized in this scientific research you wonder what else is reflecting maybe shiva that's in there so you have for example the cosmic dance of shiva that 
some of the employees are noted for that they do did as part of a, I don't know, celebration or a reopening of, of CERN a few years ago. And that's the dance of God. And what it is, Shiva is depicted in Indian history as within a burning halo or an orb, which gods are typically uh, depicted in an orb. And Shiva is not only the god of destruction, but in this dance, it signifies that Shiva destroys to recreate a new world. And the level of the technology that is Mm -hmm. being developed there is absolutely sort of extraordinary in terms of what it's trying to do. And who knows, it may have access to weaponry and power that is is really sort of unknown. Shiva is has a direct connection as a destroyer god into an angel of the abyss. And that is Abaddon and Apollyon in Revelation 9 that's going to be released just before the midpoint of the last seven years. And Abaddon in Hebrew means destroyer. Hmm. It's not a name of an angel, it's a title. Apollyon means destroyer in Greek. Again, not a name, but a title for a destroyer god. In the book of Enoch, the destroyer god would be understood as Azazel. And Azazel is the host of the rebellious ones of the abyss put in there for their crimes. He is a angel that taught the art of war and the art of making weaponry to the antediluvian world. He's the one that is the scapegoat that the Book of Enoch lays all the sins of the antediluvian world, even though there's other ones that participated. He's the leader. He's one of the Satans. He isn't Satan as in the Satan, but he's a very important angel, and he's a he's a war god that parades through the knowledge that merges with the seven sacred sciences of Enoch, the heavenly knowledge of the angels that is illicit and not permitted, or the knowledge of the gods and polytheism that goes to all civilizations around the world, and it merges to develop this technology that brings about the flood or the first apocalypse by water. Mm -hmm. And so it starts to bring in some more parallels in terms of uh, the days of Noah that we talked about. Biblically, Azazel doesn't really show up in the King James Version, but the word scapegoat does. The second goat sacrificed on the Day of Atonement that's sent out into the wilderness, just as in a lot of polytheist legends, Azazel is hung in the wilderness. This is an unexplained sacrifice, and the word scapegoat goes back to the Hebrew word Azazel. Hmm. And this is part of the laws that are given to Israel to do as part of their Feast of the Lord that they go through every year. And so we have this Azazel God that is the leader of those angels who is the destroyer God, likely Abaddon and Apollyon, who's going to come out of the abyss just before the midpoint of, of the last seven years. Hmm. Now, Azazel was a watcher, but he, has, he will be degraded for his rebellion. So he, as a watcher, he would have been an Ophanim, which is one of a, a four-faced Uh, angel like a cherubim and only one face difference because one of its faces is a cherubim. Uh, You have a cherubim as a watcher, you have archangels as as a watcher, and you have the seraphim. And he's thought to have been a seraphim watcher who has been degraded to goat god status as the destroyer god, as in a satyr. Sa'ir, as it goes back to Hebrew, which means hairy, shaggy, goat god, ear watcher that's the hebrew word for watcher that's used four times in daniel four and there's more than one of these degraded satyr gods that israel is told not to worship as devil gods and you take that back at satyr and it says goat god and you also have the satyrs that are shown in end time prophecy in isaiah 13 And Isaiah 34, one at the destruction of Babylon and one for the day of the Lord. And so these beings are coming back, these degraded goat gods. And the degraded goat gods in Greek mythology were known as very promiscuous, let's say, uh, types of gods who 
were, I think, continuing to do things that, as part of the rebellious angels, they would have been degraded, not in the abyss because they didn't create the sexual crimes, but I think they disappear because they, after the flood, they begin to do some sexual crimes. And we'll go to the abyss, just like the Balim go to the abyss after the flood. So there are many goat gods that are listed around the world. It makes me think about, we, we've done some episodes on Nate on, on Mount Hermon and the, the pan worship at, at Mount Hermon. And as, yeah. Gary's, as Gary's pulling this thread, you have Azazel who led the watchers at Mount yeah. Hermon and you have this, Pana- this cult of Panaeus there. You know, Jesus shows up on the scene too and basically, you know, basically fires shots over the bow, says, this is, this is, you know, this is mine now. This, this, this mountain belongs to me. The association there is fascinating. And I think too, the idea that connecting Shiva with Azazel and then realizing that like and Apollyon realizing the prophetic you know connection of that and then this is the emblem this is the mascot yeah for you know per se for CERN yeah and at Mount Hermon not only was there the pan white house domed so to speak temple but you also had the gateway to Hades there Mm -hmm. yeah yeah. Right. Which would be a portal, which is, again, is significant in occult history that Jesus went to basically announce that, you know, I'm going to build my church and your uh, rebellion is over. But Pan is only one of these goat mm-hmm. God. Right. So I think there's many of them. Um, Bacchus is another one in Roman mythology. There are other ones like Baphomet, Baphomet, that the Templars worshipped. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have uh, one called Innis in Greek mythology, another one called Phanos, just as fawns show up in fairy tales. Yeah, Gary, we just interviewed a uh, brother and sister whose mother, their mom married a, a guy for like a year, and their stepdad was deeply involved in the occult. And he said he saw, the brother saw a Baphomet in his closet, and his dad was, you know, a warlock, uh, stepfather. And tied to these secret societies, they think. And I wonder if his father was specifically loyal to that goat god. Is that is that how like down to the nuts and bolts that some of these occult practices get, where they actually know exactly who they're communicating with? Well, in, within the occult uh, societies, secret and other types of occult societies, it's populated by bloodlines. And the bloodlines that they keep their genealogies on go back to uh, a specific Nephilim or Raphaim and a specific angel. So if I can use one as an example, and you could do a whole show on on, on this one, (laughs) uh, is you have Vlad the Impaler, which is the character that Dracula is based on. And he's the typical Scythian, Tuatha Duda Nan, Raphaim after the flood. He has red hair, hazel eyes pale skin, night operator, because he's allergic to the sun. He's educated in the mystery school of Solomon. And he takes his bloodlines back to the Scythians and back through to a specific angel named uh, Tamiel, whose name is listed a little bit differently in the book of Enoch, but that would be Kazadea uh, in the book of Enoch. They are that specific. Wow. And Prince Charles III takes his lineage, and you can Google this and get the articles where it's written up. And he, many years ago, he said he takes his genealogy in part back to Vlad the Impaler. Wow. Yeah. So it's important. These, so they would be worshiping a specific God. Their scioning may have them or grafting into bloodlines may have them worshiping a few more gods and they may worship the overall pantheon, but there's one from it's a like, bloodline perspective that they would honor even more. And so the coat of arms would reflect that. Like a Patreon God, essentially, right? Like the whole. Yeah. yeah, yeah a yeah. Patreon God. Absolutely. So. There's another uh, goat god in Greek history called uh, Aegea Pan that's different than the other Pan. And then you've got a Celtic god that's named Cernunos, which is a horn god as well of nature. So these are all nature gods. And Cernunos is the same god that, because this goes back to the ancient Scythians migrating to 
England and, and carrying the same pantheon over there. Well, they're just different vernacular names for the same kinds of gods, but there's one that's specifically that nails it. So just as you have these Indo-Aryans, and there's four different groups, and they're called many things, Tuatha Danu, uh, the Datanu, the tribe of Anu, Aryans, they're called Raphaim, they're, they're the same people. The Etruscans that were there before the Romans come to power and when they set up Rome, they actually set up like a pan temple that the sibling prophecies are going to inherit. But there's one other god that's in there that's really kind of interesting, and that is the god named Cern. Really? Exactly as, a, as that. And it was a stag god as well, another horn god. So this is goes back to those gods of the early post-Diluvian world. You wanted to, to get in on that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So CERN was named after this this god, not nothing to do with the science. Yeah, it's not an acronym. Yeah, it's a convenient acronym. Interesting. So you have CERN and you have Shiva. Yeah. You have a destroyer god and you have this this horned god that predates the, the twins or the, or the twin mythology of Rome, right? Which, yeah. What about where they build the facilities themselves? Is there any significance? Well, there well there is Apollo that you were talking about, which is connected to Apollyon in the, the Greek grouping of words is called in Etruscan god Apollo, which is the same god as Apollo in Sumerian mythology and or Enlil as, as he can be described also, and also connected to Nergal that's listed in, in, in the Bible as uh, being one of the underworld and, and a war god. But specifically, as, as you get to the location and you start to work that back, you've got a location for CERN that's close to the Swiss, you know, border and it's mm. in a town called Saint Jeanne Poulier and it is a temple that's been dedicated to Apollyon in its history. Wow. wow. Yeah. And it's called in Roman as opposed to French the, the Apollyacom. And it drives from a Latin uh, Apollyanu, which goes back to a Greek poly Apollyon in its etymology. So you have this place in saint Jeanne Poulie where you've got this temple of Apollyon, and it's like within, you know, a, a couple of kilometers of the CERN plant. And of course, that would have had a portal location associated with as an ancient holy site. They would have had, you know, ley lines crossing through for power, and they would have also had portals that would go to the underworld. And so Apollo is the Greek god of death and pestilence, as and also a sun god, and also a son of a god, which is kind of like an antichrist kind of sort of scenario that goes. So do I believe that the abyss is located right below there? Probably not, but it has importance to the location of the abyss where Apollyon would be. So the abyss would be no, would be located in the earth, yes, as it's described. In the other world, netherworld, and when all the different places, different names it has around the world. So it'd be like Tartarus within Hades, right? The mm -hmm. abyss within the underworld. So it's a prison that's located in, in Sheol, as it's described in, in, in Hebrew. But you have these portals that go into the underworld, in the center of the underworld, all over the world. They have different names in every different culture. So, you know, even at uh, Gilgal Raphaim, for example, you have like a hundred different portals. And if people don't know what Gilgal Raphaim is that means wheel of the gods or I mean wheel of the giants, wheel of the giants. and it's right at the foot of Mount Hermon so uh, no coincidence there it's, that's also known as a few other names but it all mm. goes back to sort of the same kind of meaning so one of the things that they're trying to do at CERN I think with quantum computing is to get into a different dimension so the underworld is occupies the same space but in another dimension and I think that one of the main things, not all of, but one of the things that they're trying to do is use this technology because they're celebrating the occult sciences. They're celebrating occult religion. They've earmarked it with Shiva, which, as we've talked about, is Azazel, Apollyon, Abaddon. I think they're trying to get into that dimension where the other world is and into the abyss and release their gods that were imprisoned, the gods who created the Nephilim before the flood, the Raphaim after the flood, the 
parent gods and the offspring gods and let them out before the end time because they want to bring about the end time, but on their own time frame and before uh, from a Christian perspective, which I am, the ordained time of God. And the Balim, as I said, are were, were offspring gods like Enlil and Anki, like Zeus and Osiris, as opposed to the parent gods, right, that were before the flood. So mm-hmm. somehow they get killed or they're overthrown. I think they all go to the abyss. What's interesting, there's a passage in a book called uh, Pistis Sophia. Sophia is the god of wisdom and the creator god goddess of the 12 angels that they would say includes the god of the bible and it's the word that philosophy is based on the love of wisdom the love of sophia part of the seven sacred sciences and all of the imagery that sort of goes in it sophia is part of being intermixed with ai and virtue in things that they're creating after her name and naming uh, projects about her but in there in book four chapter 126, it talks about these 12 rulers that are in there from before the flood. And these are the 12 angels that she created, but, and I won't go through all of them, but these are the type of creatures that are in there. And they're going to lead out the scorpion beings out of the abyss when they do come out that have the ability to destroy the world. And Mm. the scorpion beings were created by Tiamat, the wife and uh, consort of Apsu. And Tiamat was a dragon, serpent, Leviathan type of goddess. And she also created all sorts of other beings as well. Won't go into those, but Mm. the first one that's listed is has a crocodile's face and it has tail in his mouth. So you have that Oribus imagery and a crocodile like the Ogdo gods in Egypt. You have the second one that has a cat's face or can be translated as a lion's face. So you got all of these lion gaze like Sekhmet and Nergal and gods like that. Uh, you have the third one, a dog faced one named Arkarok. And then you have in the fourth one, a serpent face god. And you go all through these ones. You even have the Hydra ones at the end. These are the 12 rules rulers that were locked into the abyss. So they weren't killed. Uh, So I think the offspring gods went there as well. And these are the ones beings that they want to release into the world to complete the rebellion that they failed with in the first go around uh, before the flood. It's like a jailbreak. Yeah. It's, it, it makes a ton of sense, right? You have all this Apollo imagery and branding and Shiva and Astro. You have all this Apollyon stuff. And then you realize that like, you know, quantums is really dimensional based science it sounds like they almost are making like a modern day ziggurat. Yeah. Well, and in the occult, ziggurats, towers, pyramids were similar kind of beings. Some say they were the same. They may be slightly different shape, but they were built for more than just what we're told that they're built for. Right. right? They're not but, just yeah. tombs and they probably were never tombs, but they were likely some sort of, as a lot of groups will uh, speculate, some sort of power machine energy machine some people think it had ability to go into different dimensions with the power and the locations that it would be located at so Hmm. if you roll forward to the days of noah again but after the flood you have an individual that's named nimrod who is the first grand master of masonry after the flood and writes the first constitution and he receives the seven sacred sciences from hermes according to Freemasonry and Gnostics, and applies this ancient knowledge, builds Babel City and Babel Tower, Hmm. right? And he's in rebellion against God, and he's taken up the pantheon and religion that's before the flood, and he's building this tower. Now, and we get an understanding in that narrative that acting as one people of one language, anything they decide to do, they can do. So they have this knowledge that is explained through uh, Gnosticism and Masonics, at least what they believe that he re- that Nimrod received this ancient knowledge. And Babel is understood in Hebrew as confusion of the languages. But we get the Babel story in many accounts around the world, from the Aztecs, the Kishamaya, to the Sumerian account of Enmer Akar and Eridu. And you also get an Armenian account. And you also get an interesting understanding through the Akkadians, which Nimrod is the patriarch thereof after he stays in Shinar or Sumer after the dispersion at Babel. And they 
spell Babel, B-A-B-E-L. You can see it spelled that way coming out of uh, Babylonian translations, but also Babalu, I-L-U. I-L-U and E-L are the same meaning, just a different transliteration in a different language. So in Hebrew, E-L is a god or Mm -hmm. angel or the god. And it can also mean mighty and powerful. So another transliteration as an example would be Al, just as Baal would be Lord God, right? In terms of his understanding or master gods, some people translate it. So Babalu or Babel out of the Akkadian version, you have the understanding of El as a god. And then Bab as the word translated as Akkadian as gateway or mm. portal. So Mm. you've got in the mythology of Nimrod that he's saying, if God ever gets out of line again, he's going to climb the ziggurat Mm -hmm. and he's going to find a way to kill the God of the universe. Or if he threatens to bring about the flood or another flood, he's going to do the same thing. This Tower of Babel, nobody, I don't think, believes it could reach actually into heaven. But if he was building a gateway of the gods, portals into other dimensions he may have planned as antichrist will do in the end time and daniel 8 10 verses 8 to 10 will storm heaven probably at the time of the angels at the war in heaven at the midpoint of the last seven years and probably through the ability to go through these portals and into heaven and i think that's what he was trying to do two things is one if he Mm. had to is to make war in heaven as an antichrist type figure And two, to go into the underworld and get more support by the gods that he's now worshiping. We know that, you know, just on a human level, you have these these crime families that set up fronts, right? They have the front. Oh, this is a this is our front business. But behind the scenes, they're actually really working their crime. You know, we've had a lot of people come on our show and say even just the observatories in the world are all fronts for something else. There's like portals and there's other things that they're technology they're keeping hidden. Is CERN just a front for what they're really, you know, what they're really trying to do that a majority of the people don't realize that there's probably a select number of people that actually understand what they're trying to do here? We've heard on the show there's portals in all places around the world, but what human beings seem to do is they have, we have to use electronics and technology to pull off what some of the ancients could do. Is this just like a giant cell phone that we're building? But, but, you know, the ancients could telepathically communicate, but we have to build something with electronics to pull off what the ancients could do with stones and pyramids and... Yeah, so... The giants either had the technology both before and after the flood to do it, or they had different bodies before it got diluted through intermarrying with humans, wouldn't prevent them to do it sort of naturally. So you would have to create that technology. You could make an argument that both are, you know, might be the case or one might be the case. So I think that that's the case. And what you're talking about, the initiatory societies of the mafia, secret society with godfather at the head, like a godfather angel, <laughs> right? Yeah. That sort of yeah. patriarchal sort of structure and, and, and understanding is they have fronts. And that's the standard MO in occult societies. So Freemasonry would be the one that most people would understand the best at the lowest level on the thelmic tree of mm-hmm. organizational structures. They, they call that. It's like a world tree that has roots that goes down into the underworld and connects into heaven. Mm. Uh, that's the uh, imagery they like to to project on that. So Freemasonry is this organization that has 33 degree Scottish adepts at the top and you have third degree York right. But underneath 32nd degree and lower and second degree and lower respectively, they're learning stuff, but they don't know the true secrets and they're designed there to be a front. So they show all of this great community work and effort so that they can work in secrecy. This is a standard operational tactic that is used. So one would expect anything connected to an occult society to do that because it just allows them the freedom to to do what they want to do. And I think that's exactly what what, what is going on there. And again, people may not be maybe a bit surprised to see me connect the mafia with secret societies, (laughs) but it's the same type. It is. And it's the Cosa Nostra, right? right? They are a secret society of itself because you don't. You don't talk about it. You don't. Yeah. No one. No one rolls, and no one tells the secrets of the. And they have rituals and rites, right? I mean, yeah. they burn. They burn the saint in the hand. Yeah. Very, very much is. Very much so. And again, within polytheism, you have the micro dualism, as you have the macro dualism, and in the micro dualism, you have black magic and white magic. 
You have good witches and evil witches. You have good wizards and bad wizards. You have good Nephilim and you have bad Nephilim. This is, again, a standard in their sort of belief system. They're working the same type of knowledge, maybe with a different agenda is basically what they're doing. Gary, I have a question you brought up a couple of times and we haven't touched on this, is the, the seven sacred sciences. Yep. What, what, what are those and what, it, what exactly is that? They're the seven liberal arts that are taught in universities today. And it was uh, put into seven disciplines by Enoch, son of Cain, according to the Gnostics. And so, I mean, if people like astronomy would be one of them, right? You would have mathematics as another. You've got the first three that are going to form into philosophy that brings the whole sort of thing, like they have grammar and rhetoric, dialectics. And so anyways, there's seven of them, but it's how they're developed. And then that merging with the knowledge from the gods or the fallen angels that takes it to a level that we're just sort of catching up to today. And so that was developed into the mystery schools through the religions. Religions were set up so that wouldn't be the Enochian mystical religion was set up so that the knowledge wouldn't go to the mundane, so the Sethites, and that you would have to learn it through a degree in a mystery system. And then you would have the religion that is using this knowledge, but it's being developed with something that they're going to call the mystery schools, the education where they educate only the elite, only the bloodlines, right? And then and you have that same thing that goes on to, to this day. And the secret societies come out of the mystery schools. So if you go to university campus today, uh, if it's of any age, it's all built in Egyptian, Sumerian, Greek, and Roman architecture. It has yep. their gods plastered all over everything. They do everything by awarding degrees. And so you have this same type of sort of baby or early societies for a lot of people that they're bringing into their mysticism within the various houses that are set up on campus. Those are secret societies because they're initiatory as well. And the seven sciences were had an agenda that were established with it that is still being used today. So you have the agenda as being, first one is, is to lead people away from the God of the Bible. The second agenda is to not give God credit for anything. The third thing is to degrade God and insult God every step of the way in whatever you're doing. And then the fourth thing is to honor your own gods, which is still being done today. And so you have the birth of modern science in 1662 with the charter by King Charles, the second, as I recall, (laughs) as opposed Mm. to the third that's just been crowned. Um, with the Charter of the Royal Society, whom science pays homage today. And these were all Rosicrucians and Freemasons that were creating this new organization. And they called themselves the last of the sorcerers and the first of the scientists Hmm. in that transition. And that was the beginning of modern science. And they've Hmm. basically continued what they were doing beforehand in, in a way that was that we're going to see come to full fruition in into the end time. So that's sort of the short story on, on the seven sacred sciences and how it connects in. It's fascinating though, Nate. It is exactly what academia is doing, right? They are yeah. Yeah. trying, they're at enmity with God. They're trying to disprove God, leap people away from the God of the Bible. Oh yeah. And literally distort the things that God has created yeah. and give glory unto another, like something else. And anything in science can be discussed except for God creating yeah. anything. Yep. Yeah, right? that is. <laughs> so it's almost it's, like the 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 Tower of Babel story. It's like you you know Christians kind of grow up thinking that was a one time incident, but it seems like that rebellion has been going on since the dumb time. It's just been rebranded, repackaged, yeah, and redistributed to, to the population under the under the nope. term science. You yeah, it's nothing new is 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 under the sun, right? That's right. So it just right. continues to happen over and over and over again. What if CERN isn't a portal? What if it's some sort of automatic writing, giant Ouija board type of technology where they're trying to get... Like messages, right? Information. Yeah, it's messages. It's a cell phone. It's just a, it's a weird cell phone. They're trying yeah. to get, you know, communicate and get what they need. I think uh, that would be another part of what they're trying to do. It's not that they're not communicating today with their spirit guides, whether they're demons or fallen angels, but... Because not all the fallen angels are in the abyss and not all of the demons are in the abyss, right? So uh, there's ones that are still out. But they may be trying to find a way to communicate directly into the abyss. And what's interesting, there's a passage in Ezekiel 32 about the terrible ones that are talking to 
Pharaoh. And these terrible ones are Raphaim descended kings like the Asher and all the different names that they're going to list in Ezekiel 32 of like Elam uh, would be another sort of Raphaim name and a patriarch of one of the Sumerian nations. And these are the terrible ones that did terrible things on earth and were slain and go into the sides of the abyss. So these are demonic, the worst of this, the demons that are in there, but not all demons are, are, are in, the, in the abyss. So the Bible tells us there's ability for them to communicate, I think, in that, because they're talking with Pharaoh, who is you know, another descendant sort of Raphaim king. It goes back to our organized crime yeah. you know, metaphor that like, when the crime boss goes to prison, he still runs the, he still runs the organization. Yeah, he just has someone, someone sort of by yeah. proxy, does his stay in his stead outside, but he still is still is running it with in in you know in by for all intents and purposes. Yeah. So for me, it's it's they're going to get some information from them, but they've got other angels that can give them a lot of information, a lot of demons as well. Hmm. But they may be trying to communicate with more things, and I don't know what those things are. But there's another thing that people need to be aware of that what they're searching for and we talked about it early on in the show we we talked about them searching for particles and there's a specific one that they're searching for hmm. and this is called the atman particle or the atma particle and it's talked about in if you haven't guessed it the up and shads and the vedas and it is a very very interesting particle a it's invisible so even though they're going subatomic, they can't detect this particle. It's that hard to find. And it is a particle that they believe goes to the core of establishing godhood. And in their belief, and just as a Satan through the, the serpent was trying to provide a god, a form of godhood in the physical world for Adam and Eve, just eat this fruit from the uh, tree of good and evil. Um, he was basically saying you can be like God. And in polytheist belief system, immortality is required. And the other thing is unlimited access to knowledge and unlimited knowledge because of a God, you would be all knowing, right? Just as the all seeing eye is all knowing. And so they need to provide that. So you're going to see this technology in part that is coming out of CERN that's going to merge into, because you've got AI, quantum computing, all sorts of other things that's going to merge into other parallel lanes of technology and into eventually into the beast system and the mark of the beast uh, as a source for this knowledge and will be delivered according to the Davos people who report to the committee of 300. Um, this will be delivered through the healthcare system because people will demand that this technology that will be done all in a digital sort of basis can cure pestilence and give you immortality and that connection to this knowledge. So this Atma particle, it's, it's rather interesting. It's invisible, but what it does do is, is it merges with particles that they can measure, or at least and whether maybe other ones that they're still finding that they, they could actually find and measure. And they believe that this is the particle that has the main essence of man in it or what man can become. Mm. They believe that it is the knowledge of the universe that is accessed through this particle. And this knowledge through quantum entanglement is instantaneously sent around the whole physical universe ongoing. And they're trying to find this particle to tap into. Hmm. So that would be another thing that I think that they are trying to... Some kind of tree of life or... Yeah, like true knowledge, type good of, and evil yeah. meets the hive mind or something. Yeah, it definitely meets the hive mind, no doubt about that. And, uh, you know, just as down a different sort of rabbit hole is that, you know, one of the things that the Israelites used against the Raphaim and the hybrid giants in the uh, Exodus Wars is uh, hornets. And in the occult, with the hive mind that you're talking about, it's a trait that they believe that they inherited through their gene of Isis, their bloodlines, that is a type of telepathy that allows them to communicate. And they try and use that 
to harness their knowledge and strength to fulfill certain agendas, whatever those are that are on their mind to do, that they still believe they still have some of that today. And they have all of these bees and sometimes they're sort of uh, allegorized as this kind of fleur de lis type of thing that they have in their in their emblems, right? But it's an allegorical reference to the bee and to the hive mind. And that the hornets were the enemies of the bees and that they would just drive the Raphaim crazy into panic, that they couldn't think, that they couldn't communicate. And so it's interesting um, that the Bible has that as one of the main things on how God delivered up these giants to the Israelites because it just, they had no defense against it. Yeah, this knowledge of the world is that Borg hive mind, right? It's the same ideology where they're interconnecting and have this pooled knowledge of the universe and that they can use whatever, whether it's transhumanism and the Borg sort of analogy that they do there to give sort of you know, on ongoing life, except that they would have to be able to transition that spirit into another body if it if it got too old or uh, it's, it's immor immortality. Clone it's, any it's more like bodies? It's, it's, yeah. yeah, it's a weird immortality thing. Yeah, and it's only in the physical world. I mean, on our show, we've done it for a couple of years now. I mean, we've we've interviewed people who talk about the deep underground military bases, places underground. All the creatures we talk about on our show seem to come out from underground. Do you believe a lot of these entities are in a physical location inside the earth right now or is some place that maybe CERN could, you know, like, are they, or is it sort of like a more of a spiritual prison, something dimensional, or is there, are, is there like an actual place if you drill down deep enough and for, you know, lack of better words to describe, it could get to it. To the um, abyss? You get to the abyss, yeah. Yeah, I, some people believe that. I don't think so. I think it's in another dimension because we know it's in the underworld and we know that, you know, in the Ugaritic texts, for example, the Raphaim and the Balim gods, they would go through these portals into the underworld and they were taught rites so that when they died, they didn't want to have their heads cut off because that probably means they would go directly to the abyss or not be able to find their way in through the portals and into the protection of, of the underworld. Um, but Is they that why David about, cuts off of Goliath's head? Yeah, exactly. Weird. Yeah. Worst death, worst death they could have. And so the cutting off the head would, would permanently send them. Yeah. So if you look at the word Raphaim, it's rooted in 7495, which is the Hebrew letter, uh, numbering for it, which means healing medicine. 7496 extends out of it, and that's for the spirits and the demon aspect. And 7497 extends out of that, and that's the tribe of the giants. Giants were thought to have a healing capability as part of their natural gifts. And that if you didn't kill them suddenly, like with the taking of the head, they would have the ability to repair themselves, either through their own physics or through sarcophagi. There's two different sort of theories on that. And so they were thought to be demigods who could live longer and they could repair themselves. And of course, there were these really great warriors so that if you're going to take a kill a giant and make sure he's going to be dead just as it's allegorized of like doing that with vampires or a stake through the heart or both um mm -hmm. you know vampires being son of dracula son of a dragon son of a seraphim son of a serpentine nephilim or raphaim right is the sort of allegory goes and they also drink blood to try and extend their lives, the vampires do. So that's an allegory based on uh, on the Nephilim in, in, in the short form of it. And so that's why you would have to take his head. And so they were the Israelites were, and they had, like with the 700 slingers of Benjamin, they could split a hair at a long distance. They were more accurate than arrows. They were one of the, the best weapons that they had. So they could stun and bring the giant down and then take his head just as David does that. And that's that's not a coincidence. And it's it's a standard sort of understanding 
And, and it's interesting when you match that up with what the Egyptians look at and what the Ugaritic texts talk about and what the Sumerian texts talk about is the giants, the worst death that they could have is somebody take their head because they weren't prepared to pass through into the other world the way that they would want to go. And Crazy. so it's, 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 a, it's an interesting concept to understand. And here, here's what might freak you out. Yeah. Is is that, and this is just my speculation. I put it in at the end of my book, the chapter I'm writing right now. Is that Armageddon? You have all of these mighty ones that are there, the princes and the kings, and the mighty ones, as in in the book of Joel talk about in some other chapters. The gibberim, the, the gibberim is the word that describes the nephilim in in, in Genesis six four. Jesus is going to slay everybody with a double edged sword including Antichrist and the false prophet. I'm wondering whether he's chopping them off at the neck. Oh, interesting. We were, I mean, we were releasing an episode today, actually, about the Wendigo in North America, and a lot of the Native American traditions say you have to make sure they're dead. Yeah. You have to make sure that they've actually killed them fully because they can repair themselves is kind of what the guest was suggesting and i thought that sounded crazy but now that you say this now i'm like hey i mean i at this point most things don't sound well it sounds like wolverine sound. it sounds like x-men yeah, like it exactly. sounds like full-on like in which we know a lot of that is just repurposed demigod stuff obviously and yeah it's it's fascinating gary i, I, I had a question i want to go back to something that you, that you talked about i want to understand a little bit that some of the purpose of cern here is to let out these beings, these fallen angels, out of the abyss early. And if, if you're the darkness, and we know that, that the darkness and, and you know the factions of the darkness, they they have a, a keen awareness of the end and what's prophesied. And so, I mean, I want, I want your opinion on that because if they are trying to release these things before the appointed time, as we know, you can read in, in Revelation and, and as John wrote and John saw in Revelation, what are the, what are they thinking they can accomplish by making this happen early? Uh, I think they try. They're trying to discredit God, yeah. right? So that He's not all powerful. I, I don't believe the angels believe they can win. They deceive their offspring and the people that follow them that they can win. But what they're, you know, what they've always tried to do, I think, is to win a place separate from God, just as. You know, Satan wanted to be like God, but away from God. He want they want their own realm. And so if you look at what God is letting play out, it's the creation of the Adamites is the resolution to the angelic rebellion. And that all the names that are going to be until the end time, and the one ex also expects there's a list in there that's part for the for the millennium as well. But all the names were written in the book of life before creation, right? So it they're trying to stop some of mankind from having a chance to earn their immortality to become mm. like angels. They were actually trying to destroy humans from even having a chance. But once the resurrection happened, that was basically over. And Jesus would have spoke to them and did in first Peter while he was in the grave that basically saying my speculation that the, uh, your rebellion's over because I'm going to resurrect on the Sunday here. And, uh, you're going to be sent to the lake of fire when all of this sort of happens. And so what they're, what they're trying to do is create a scenario that might permit them not to go to the lake of fire and to have their own realm that if they could stop the almighty from having things happen at the ordained time two things would happen one is is he's not almighty and the second thing is is not all the names were allowed to be oh. able to accept their destinies and so what's holding them back you can argue whether it's the holy spirit or michael you can make a good argument for both is the restrainer um, is holding it back until the ordained time. And so it's going to play out until the uh, restrainer is moved at the midpoint of the last seven years with, when Antichrist takes power. Because the restrainer is not here to prevent the empire, the last empire from rising. It's been trying to prevent, not trying, but successfully preventing Antichrist from coming to power through the beast empire since the beginning. But until it the, will permit it at, at a certain at point. At the point in time, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do, what do you think the UN role in this is? Because we talked about, you talked about two different societies or, or organizations, not even societies for all intents and purposes, but organizations that don't really have a, don't have a national an answer. Like they don't, they don't have to answer to any sort of nationality or country, right? Yeah. What do you, what's, what are the role they play in there? So yeah, CERN is part of the technological aspect about bringing about the end time. The UN, which CERN is a member of, UN is designed to bring about the 10 kings of the end time. 
world government, right? That's their, and they're trying, and they work with all these other agencies to try and create a central organization that transcends all national borders. So they'll take advantage of any natural catastrophe, any contrived catastrophe to move that forward, just as they did with the last pestilence. But here's here's the thing, though, is, is that there's another piece of allegory that's in CERN, which is the Atlas experiment. So Atlas is the king of Atlantis with nine other kings. And he's the offspring of Poseidon and uh, Clyto, a female human being. So he's a demigod. And Atlantis was the place where it was the greatest society of the world, the greatest technology, the greatest development of knowledge. And it was trying through war to take over the whole world, according to Plato and Critias and Timaeus. And so they're, they, they don't get it done, but this is part of the golden age. This is that new age that they want to bring back when men walked amongst angels, right? Amongst the God. They want to bring that back as that golden age, but they call the new age of Atlantis as Francis Bacon called it, right? Hmm. Another Rosicrucian, no, no coincidence there, but that's a whole different, and, and the uh, inspirational founder of the Royal Society that we talked about earlier with his ideas on the new Atlantis and his picture still hangs in the entrance to the uh, head office of the Royal Society in London to this day. So, I mean, all coincidence, right? But anyways, right. they're they're trying to bring about the new Atlantis, the 10 kings of the end time, just as you have 10 kings that are prophesied in Daniel, you know, as toes in Daniel 2, as seven horns in Daniel 7 and 8, seven kings, horns and toes that are also mixed into the allegory of Revelation 13 and 17. And Atlas was a I would call him, as Nimrod is a post-Diluvian Antichrist archetype, Atlas in this allegory of Atlantis would be an antediluvian Antichrist, mm. just as you know, we're told the spirit of the Antichrist has been with us, at least since the time of the New Testament, so probably right from the beginning of Adamite creation. Wow. Hmm. Dang, Steve. The way that history repeats itself, like via Atlantis, kind of the Atlantis that's coming again is interesting. And I think a lot of times I, I think like how the enemy doesn't realize it's giving away, it's tipping its cap to what it's going to do because of what it's done in the past and just the layers there are fascinating. It's amazing how these things that are happening now, like you can run it, like we talked about the Solomon, nothing's new under the sun. You can pull it all the way back to, to Eden and, and all the way back to the golden age and this, and they're still, they're still trying. It just looks a little different. But yeah. it's, it's the same. It's the same it's strategy. Nothing new under the sun. Nothing so just new. as Nimrod tried to raise his throne to heaven, Antichrist will do the same thing. All Antichrist type archetypes in in the past declare themselves as gods, and they would have they would have the same sort sort of goal goal. It's this. It's it's why you can learn so much about understanding prehistory to what's going to happen. Mm. In, in the end time, plugging my book, that was, I couldn't help myself on that. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> so the, the spirit of Satan is that original rebellion. It's that, it's that massive ego that I, I want to be dominant. I don't want anyone or anything telling me what to do. And sort of the fall of mankind might be the spread of that lie to all humanity. Because if you think about it, all these secret societies, all these ancient empires, they all want nobody in charge of them they all want to be the key to their own destiny they all want to live forever they all want their own territory their own empire is that sort of what satan does when he he tricks humanity is he sort of puts that that disease in all of us that you don't want you don't want to be loyal to the god of heaven you want to be, you want to be your own you want to be your own thing is that kind of what sin did to humanity and then all these empires they still believe this original lie that they can win they can take over. They can they can claim their own empire. Yeah, because they 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 want to be little gods, right? They want to be a god on their own. They want to make their own rules, right? And they want to live away from God because and that God won't try and try and destroy them. So that's that's the lie that they bought into, and that they can win this. And so you see that in science fiction. I mean. You, there's that movie and there's a series out with Doctor Strange and you have this evil dark lord of the universe and you have this one little bright spot, which is Earth, that the occult religions and superheroes are trying to fight for to have their own realm. That's what they want. Hmm. 
yeah so it and you see that allegory whether or not it's the rebels in um star wars it's over and over and over they just want to have their own realm away from the god of the bible uh and they deceive people that they can win yeah and what do you say to like some some people like listen to our show and they want us to take a different approach sometimes they have more of the preterist understanding of things but if you if you listen to this conversation i mean it's just building their army is just building and building and building and it's going to get to a point where it's going to be like Christ is going to have to return to reclaim all of this. I mean, what do you say to some of those people that thought, think that some of these ancient stories were already fulfilled, the prophecies were already fulfilled? Yeah. And what do you, I mean, I'm sure you get that a lot, but. I, I do. And, you know, I do engage in, and there's different kinds of preterists, right? They have some different sort of levels of beliefs. And from a, from a Christian perspective, how I approach prophecy doesn't always line up with all of these labels that they have on different kinds of es eschatology. The problem yeah. I have with those, and they say, so which one are you? And I'm going, I don't follow that. <laughs> Look, if, you're, if you've got a preconceived conclusion, everything that you're going to read is going to be biased by that preconceived conclusion. But then you're forced to, with preconceived conclusions, to ignore inconvenient passages. So when I get into whether it's social media, particularly on, on different avenues of social media, where I'll run into somebody, they'll say, well, how do you explain this? So you do. And then they say, they don't go back and try and win that argument. They'll say, well, what about this? And so you explain that. Then you go, they go, what about this? They do a, a chase the rabbit argument because they can never sort of put down the argument that you just explained away and saying, because what they do is they don't include all of the passages. And that's mm -hmm. the only way that, that they can make it work. So my approach is a little bit different. I have a 10 point plan. People are welcome to it if they want to email me through my website, the Genesis 6 conspiracy. But one of the unique things that I do is I try not to ignore any inconvenient passage because it has to fit. And then the other thing what I do, which the other ones all do not that I'm I'm aware of, is is that I put all prophecy around what Jesus said, not vice versa. Yeah. And when you do that, the chronology lays itself out and you don't get contradictions. Hmm. Man. Man. We get some of that sometimes. We're a creatures podcast. So we talk about the weird blurry figures out there and in order to understand where they come from there's lots of shows out there that they don't want to like you said they don't want to bring all of that into the conversation every single part of the the story in to make sense of these creatures they just want to talk about weird spooky stories and that's it but we talk a lot about the bible we talk about a lot about ancient history and you have to make sense of all these things but it just sounds like this this war this rebellion is so much bigger it is it, it's 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 so much grander we need a savior yeah we have one yeah, we have one. We do. Yeah, it, well, and that's why you have the creation of the Adamites. It's not that God didn't foresee everything happening. He's Alpha Omega, but he lets everything play out through free choice. So he knows Satan is going to deceive or have the Nakash, the Nakash, uh, deceive e, uh, Eve, and then both Adam and Eve are going to eat for the tree of evil. He knows what's going to happen with Cain. He knows what's going to play out before the flood. He knows giants are going to be after the flood again. He's let everything play out through free choice and enough time to fulfill the names in, in the book of life that everybody has a chance not to erase their names out. He's letting it play out. He knows how it's going to play out and that he knows that he's going to bring this about through the Holy Covenant, and he's going to bring Jesus, the Word of God, into the world through the Holy Covenant and Israel. Even though Israel's going to backslide, he knows all of this, and, and the time frame is going to have to be played out through the curses of the covenant versus the blessings of the covenant because they backslide so much, but he still is going to bring them back in at the end. But we know that the angels don't, don't know everything because, as the book of Corinthians talks about they wouldn't have crucified Jesus had they known about the resurrection. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of the whole plan. And then the resurrection permits humankind by choice with very little knowledge that the angels had all kinds of knowledge on uh, to be raised up to be like angels. And then we will judge those angels for the crimes against humanity. But when I say the Adamites are the resolution to the angelic rebellion is we have to look to what happens at the end time is that you have not only satan going to the abyss for a thousand years 
but you also have the angels are going to go to the lake of fire. All of the fallen angels, as Matthew 25 talks about, they're going to go to the place prepared for angels and the, and the Satan, that they're going to be there like the false prophet, like Antichrist, like those who take the mark in the lake of fire, which is a different place than Hades or the abyss. And to have hell translated that's encapsulating three different terms, you have to actually take it back to Greek and Hebrew to figure out what the word hell is referring to when it's when it's in most of the English translations. But the end time is the resolution when Jesus comes back to the angelic rebellion. And through that process, we're having the resurrections, and then you're going to have the millennium. And what's interesting about the millennium is, is that you're going to have a thousand-year reign of Christ, which is just like a rule that was going on in heaven with the angels, but they're going to let Satan out at the end of the thousand years, and a lot of humankind are still going to rebel. I think that's a humility factor for humankind that, you know, we're no better than the angels, but we will be raised up like angels through free choice, uh, through very little knowledge and faith, where and given immortality, whereas angels were given mortal immortality right from the beginning. So the end time is the resolution to that angelic rebellion. Yeah, it's a great story. It's a wild story. It's the best story. <laughs> well, it's just so much. I, I, it's sad that so many people just don't see it. They just can't. They no, they been, don't want to see it. Yeah. They've been neutered. A lot. Yeah. Well, a lot of them are brainwashed, but a lot of them just, you know, I'd rather die than believe that. I mean, yeah. and they'll probably get their wish, but there's more people that are believing it today than ought to. And that's because of all of the brainwashing and preparation that's going on for them to accept the delusion mm. for a special generation, the fig tree generation, where all of this comes together. That is, it's one of the overarching signs in, in uh, Jesus's oratory and chronology of the end time in Mark uh, 24, I mean, Mark 13, Matthew 24, Luke 17 and 21. So the fig tree generation is this one generation and all the things that he said are going to come to pass. Mm. The earth and heavens are going to pass away, but his words aren't going to pass away. Right. It right. makes me wonder, uh, all these secret societies, do they eventually all come together? And Because they're all so fragmented, right? They work together. They they have competing agendas at, at times, but they all have, have a specific agenda that they're working on. So they're working together. It's the bloodlines that are where the real rivalries are. And it's the bloodlines that will present several antichrists in the end time, just as Matthew 24 and... Mark 13 and the epistles of John talk about Antichrist in plural. And just as Gog, in the Gog War, just before the midpoint of the last seven years after the abyss has been opened, is a giant name that comes out of polytheism. It does not come out of the table of nations. He's uh, Gog of Magog. Magog comes out of the table of nations with Japheth, but Gog doesn't. And Gog is, is as they take that back to Greek and Hebrew, because it shows up in both Testaments, it's a end-time Antichrist figure. Not the Antichrist, but another counterfeit Antichrist. So there's going to be several. And Gog is the son of Iapetus, a parent god in the Greek mythology, who also fathered other giants. A couple of them are Magog and Albion, which is, you know, famous gods out of British history as well. It's amazing that you have Gog that's in there, and it does, that name doesn't show up anywhere, but he's Gog of Magog. And I think the Japhethites intermarried with the giants in the Scythian region after the flood. And I think they took the names of many of the giants from antediluvian history and as a sign of their slide into polytheism. Or Bible writers changed their name to reflect that. Love it. Yeah, sorry, we kind of went on some rabbit holes there. I know we were talking about CERN, and I'm sure you want to probably wrap up the show talking about CERN itself. Yeah. Yep. Leave you with, if just like to get in a little bit about this Atma particle, because it's going to be so important with the, with the technologies. Yeah. Um, and this is coming from the uh, Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> if I got that right, I always trip over that one. Here's what it says, and I won't give all the verse numbers on it, but it's the main essence of man is the Atman. And I talked about that earlier. And it is... Um, when you are in sort of connection to the Atma particle, you're in divine harmony. And what that means in their, in their writings is the divine Atman is the divine spirit, the supreme spirit in your body. 
It's like the counterfeit wisdom. It's the Sophia, the goddess of wisdom in your body, right? The divine Atman can reside in the body, but it does not intermix with the body. So just Mm. as the Atma particle is part of mingling with a subatomic particle that communicates knowledge to the whole universe, we're going to connect into that. So through this beast technology, through this hive technology, and it's going to be residing in the body, but not intermixing with the body. And it's also the known as the source of everything. So knowledge and information is the source of everything uh, in their belief system. And it is something that you you have to not only allow in yourself, but you have to give it worship. And what a lot of people try and do today is they like to meditate, become in communication with that particle for however short period of time. So meditate, use of yoga through meditation and the yoga and the sort of the purity of those old rituals is was also designed to do that. And it's used in that type of ritual is also used in the Buddha type of yoga to what they say to to attain the divine consciousness. Hmm. Yeah, that's like an incarnation to yeah. receive a divine consciousness and and also to receive the Godhead. So the avatar avatar concept out of the Eastern religion is like uh, what happens with Antichrist, I think, to a certain degree, where he receives the power of the of the dragon or Satan. And Vishnu did an incarnation into Buddha. So Antichrist is called like a new Buddha. And Shiva had also many incarnations as well, uh, probably a dozen incarnations. And that's the avatar with the avatar. And in the Bible, we know that that's possible because Satan enters into Judas to give him extra power and courage to betray Jesus. Mm. That's what they're doing with, with the incarnation. It's part of that divine, not only knowledge, but the power of that spirit of the mother goddess that they're going to be trying to provide for you. Here's what you're going to really like, I think, to finish it off as part of that godhood concept. So it's the highest stage of yoga, and it's used to traverse the final stage of evolution. And so they want to have a world government and a world religion so that they can evolve into gods and vibrate to the next level. Man, yeah. I, I never really thought about it that way, Gary, because, I mean, it sounds like if, if CERN is looking for that god particle, that thing that we don't have access to that kind of limits human beings as we are but if we can get to this god particle then we can sort of give the original deception to people on this technological scale like everyone can have the deception of the garden of eden there's this like kind of hidden tree of knowledge in that they're looking for right so it's something they can distribute. If they find this God particle and they can figure out how to put it in everybody, they can permanently alter the, alter God's creations, convert them into something that's not yep. in the image of God. But some people, some people just think that's going to be something as easy as getting a shot. And it's interesting that CERN is connected to the internet because the internet feels like it's sort of a crude version of what we're talking about, like a very Model T version of the knowledge that they want to give everyone, the knowledge of God. Um, is sort of this multi Google brain database that's all these systems connected. And I think you kind of mentioned that. Yeah. I mean, it, it's going to be, it's definitely next level because all of the parallel technologies are going to have to merge to an implant system that Davos is talking about um, that will be connected to all of this uh, technology and connected to all of the knowledge and all of the systems and that sort of hive connection. So what exactly it is, I think it's still developing because we haven't seen all of those lanes merge. I mean, you're going to see cryptocurrency merge into it, but it's all going to be delivered through one access point. Oh, man. I like it. I mean, and it's great, Gary, because you need all this history. And you need this knowledge of all these secret societies and the Nephilim and the the dynasties of old to make sense of kind of what they're trying to do in the future and what they're doing through this technology. And, and the front of a particle collider when it's probably something much more sinister. So I love your, your brain and your deep dive and your ability to like remember all these names and places. I mean... I wish I had some of that ability because, I mean, (laughs) I was always just kind of spacing out in history class and now I'm kicking myself because most of our show is that. So I appreciate you, Gary, with with the deep knowledge and 
ability to remember these names and just rattle them off is impressive. So, well, and you know, before I came back to 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 Jesus and to God, and before I became a prophecy buff, I was a mythology and a history buff, and I read everything I could get my hands on when I was young. So when I started to see those connections, and one of the reasons why um, I put so much of that into the first book is is I could see in those other cultures around the world, they're talking about the same thing just through that polytheist lens. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's all there. It's just how you interpret it. Yeah. yeah. I'm also impressed. On, there's one like weird thought that doesn't need any explanation, but just the amount of power that we need to to run something like like the CERN Collider yeah. and then realizing that they were doing these things in the Golden Age with... A whole different level of technology. Yeah, it's, it's mind-blowing to even think about like... The, the way we try to replicate ancient technology today and, and all of the hoops we have to jump through and all of these immense amount of power to run these things was essentially something they knew, they knew very, very well. And when we're told it was a bunch of knuckle draggers that were learning how to, yeah. how to start fires in caves. Right. I mean, yeah, the propaganda that we get uh, and the hidden history that still, I mean, I, I believe that a lot of these polytheist organizations and religions have more of the ancient knowledge than they're wanting to reveal. And they're trying to manipulate humankind. I mean, they're they're the spurious offspring of, of the fallen angels and they're trying to destroy humankind. It's been it it's been hidden from us. It is. Do you think that we'll see some of these entities before the hive mind is launched or yes. it's gonna be after the fact? Okay. I do believe. Yes. So I think that we're going to see fallen angels become whether or not they're revealing themselves as fallen angels, probably more likely at different sort of technological levels of aliens to mm -hmm. explain it away. Uh, but at some, at some point in time, it's going to be so obvious. But at, if they do their job right, they'll bring the God of the universe down to their level, right? So when you have war in heaven, it you know, might just be, we'll see that and it's going to play out in our heavens as opposed to the spiritual heaven. I think we'll only see maybe the tail end of that because it seems to me that, you know, Michael has to remove and his armies have to remove them from storming into heaven and some of the starry host will come down to the earth. So certainly by the midpoint of the last seven years with the opening of the abyss and then the war in heaven, we're going to see these beings. And uh, I think that's why we have things like, you know, dragons and satyrs that are dancing in Isaiah 13 and show up in Isaiah 34 mm -hmm. as well and other creatures. Mm -hmm. My last question, do you think that there's things in nature that sort of mimic prophecy, like you were talking about the wasps and the bees and the way they interact? Do you think God designed them in a way to kind of give us clues to? Yes, really? I do. I do. I think a lot of the knowledge is out there in front of us. We just don't make those sort of connections, right? You know, in, in sort of the, you know, the predator world, they would be sort of like the dark forces, right? And all of the, so they'd be, and, and, and unclean animals are the dark forces and all the clean ones are the light forces and they have different behaviors. And in the insect world, you have the same thing. And so, and every predator has its own predator. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I kept bees for a while, so that's why I was asking. I, uh, yeah. So, yeah, so bees would be the good guys, I you think. Dabble. But, you yeah. dabble in bees, yeah. Nate. Yeah, I did. Right. But, uh, <laughs> I, and I, but, but what I think what they do, what they like about the bees is they like the, the sacred geometry within the hives. They like the queen uh, aspect of it. It's the, divine fe the divine female, yeah, that sounds yeah, very much like. I think they've drafted it into their belief system as opposed to bees being evil because i mean the you know the bible talks about the land of milk and honey and, and honey's a good thing and that comes from the bees right so i think they just found that that was a good a good sort of allegory for their bloodlines and some of the attributes they have yeah no, everything's like hijacked and mispurpose every and counterfeited yep. yeah yep. counterfeited but that was fascinating by the way i just i appreciate that i appreciate the hive mind and and maybe that's what the technology of cern is trying to do is is find some sort of you know technology beyond our, our scope to to connect us all and com corrupt us all i never thought about it that way so i appreciate that but yeah. tell our listeners where they where they can find you interact with you and get your book and Yes, so the best way to get a hold of me is through my website at the Genesis 6 Conspiracy.com. That's Genesis 6 with the number 6 Conspiracy.com. And on that website, you can click on contact the author. And so if you have a question or 
I mentioned a few documents tonight, uh, or if you want to ask whether I got a document on something, because I got a lot of documents, mm -hmm. just ask for it by title and I'll send it to you. Or if you want to ask a question, ask me a question. It might take me two or three weeks to get back to you, but I will get back to you. And on the website, I have a generous excerpt of all 98 chapters. You can get a good feel for the book and I'll have the second book that'll be going on the same website as well. And if you want to link over to barnesandnoble.com to buy the book there, or to amazon.com or amazon.ca. You can link through my website there or to the Kindle version. And I have a page for shipping if you want to sign copy that has the US, Canada, and overseas. So lots of ways. The other way to get hold of me is through Timeline or through Messenger on Facebook. That's the only social media that I've been doing of late. And again, I will get back to you. It may take me a while, but I will get back to you. We know that. We know that. Yeah, okay, we're grateful for you. <laughs> for you coming on the show and being, yeah. being a friend of the show and, and giving us some of your time. You excited about the new book? I know we talked about it. I mentioned it at one point in the, toward the end of this episode and also at the beginning. Do you have a new book coming out? It's going to be marginally shorter than the first, but a second volume. And we're very excited to dive into that uh, when that does come out. Yeah, th thank you for spending the time and doing the research and, and coming to talk to, to us and, and our listeners just about the things of this world are not as they appear or not as they are made to appear. Or, or told, and I, and I think the farther we get down and down this journey, Nate, or on this journey, Nate, that we realize that there is, is a lot going on that they don't want us to know about, uh, and that, that they're going to tell us is a is something else. This is a giant shell game. Uh, well, there are worker bees and there are drones, so don't be a drone. Dropping all this don't hidden be. bee knowledge. That you have. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Appreciate it, Gary. Yeah, we want to yeah, be on the Gary. first on the list when you uh, release the book to do yeah. an interview. Terrific. Okay. We'll, do, we'll, Thanks, do, we'll, Gary. We'll, we'll hit you up for that. Thank you, Gary. 